Okay, folks, well, I can see we just hit uh, one minute after the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Matt Thomas, and thank you for tuning in to the USGS Landside Hazards Program Seminar Series. For those of you that are new to this meeting, you have the ability to submit questions via the chat window or to use the raise your hand feature in combination with your microphone and video camera. Uh, we typically wait until the end of the presentation to take questions, uh, but if, if they're really burning questions and, and you want them to be in the queue early, uh, you can always type them in the chat window and they'll be there uh, at the conclusion of the talk. So in the meantime, please just do your best to make sure your microphone is muted and your video is off when you aren't intending to speak. Uh, Nikita, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I am both excited and delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Denny Caps, who is the park geologist of Denali National Park and Preserve Alaska. Um, I personally had the good fortune of working with Denny a couple of years ago when I worked for the Park Service and was lucky to spend the, the brighter and warmer half of that year um, uh, in Denny's proverbial Denali backyard and field area, helping with some of the work that he will I think be sharing with us today. Um, it also happens to be one of the prettiest and most geomorphically interesting parts of the country in my opinion, so I'm looking forward to what I think will be a fascinating expose of some of Denny's work. Uh, Denny originally hails from Louisiana, where he received his Bachelor of Science at Louisiana Tech in geology. He went on to do a master's in earth science at Montana State, studying the quaternary history of the Cordier and Ice Sheet in Montana. Uh, following his master's, Denny spent a number of years across the border in Vancouver, Canada, where he pursued his PhD in earth science at Simon Fraser University, um, where he studied the context of one of the more dramatic and well-named uh, geohazards, so glacially dammed lakes and their ensuing uh, Yokel Alps or outburst floods. Denny's also long been a um, dedicated steward of the national parks and has worked throughout his career in various roles at Glacier National Park in Montana, uh, Klondike Gold Rush National Historic Park in Skagway, Alaska, um, as well as much of his PhD research in Glacier Bay National Park, Alaska. This is all prior to becoming the current Denali Park geologist in 2011, where he's served in that role since, um, and he's a, contributed a tremendous amount of work, expertise, as well as what I would call a, a nuanced combination of difficult management experience and scientific research uh, towards learning about managing and sharing with others um, Denali's geologic resources. And in particular, as he'll share with us today, uh, the unique type of landslide hazard that that environment uh, breeds. So without further ado, I will stop rolling out the red carpet, um, let him share his knowledge on the subject. So thank you for joining us, Denny, and take it away whenever you're ready. All right, thanks a lot, Nikita. I really appreciate uh, that introduction. And, uh, there's a lot of information I'd love to share with everyone today, uh, but I'm going to try to uh, keep it relatively concise and uh, and honor our, uh, our our hour slot that we have here. Try to keep it more to about 45 minutes so we can have a little bit of a discussion uh, and answer any questions that you might have. Things rolling here. I'd first like to start with acknowledgments because I'm giving the presentation today, but there are many, many people they've worked hard on this project through the years already. Uh, one of our closest partners is uh, the Federal Highways Administration, particularly the Western Federal Lands Group, and uh, in particular in, within that group, uh, Doug Anderson has made huge contributions to uh, our efforts here in Denali. Also, uh, the National Park Service, not only the geology team through the years, but all divisions within the park. Uh, as you can imagine, I work with our IT staff a lot on some of our challenges that we have uh, here with our monitoring equipment, uh, also uh, with our maintenance division here in the park, as well as the regional and Washington level uh, geology and, and uh, maintenance staff. Also, numerous other agencies, for example, the state of Alaska Department of Transportation and uh, Public Facilities, uh, for, for example, they've done a lot of the drilling for us uh, here in the park, including uh, recently the uh, Army Corps of Engineers Cold Regions Research and Engineering Lab, and also quite a few contractors through the years, uh, most notably BGC Engineering. It's back. Okay, just a quick introduction to give you an idea of what the what the site in the area is like. Uh, first, kind of give you a quick overview uh, of our problem. So this is a picture from yesterday. I uh, was out on the site. You can see that uh, winter is already uh, in effect here in Denali. And uh, that truck that you see in the background is one of the largest trucks Ford makes jacked up with big tires and a big topper on the back of it. 
So a large truck and uh, that red uh, dashed line cutting across there represents the approximate center line of the Denali Park Road uh, through there. And you can see that it is a road no more. Uh, so that really uh, defines our problem, particularly that uh, 21 foot scarp uh, there behind the truck. And you'll have to apologize. Uh, I'll have to apologize that uh, I'll talk in, in metric uh, and imperial uh, terminology here. That's just the, the world that I operate in. I like to have it smooth in one or the other, but we have to go back and forth, and I'm sure many of you do as well. So yeah, again, this was uh, image was from yesterday. I'll share some other images with you. And uh, and on September 1st this year, this landslide uh, reached its maximum displacement in, uh, in our all of our years of monitoring it and hit speeds of 40 centimeters per day. So a really substantial problem that we've got here on our hands. Getting some of the, the impacts of this, here's a picture uh, from uh, Stony Overlook, uh, a classic uh, shot that many people would like to take on a nice weather day uh, of Denali, uh, the mountain. And this is beyond uh, the area where, where the landslide is occurring. So many people want to better get to this, and this landslide potentially represents a threat to that. Uh, we get about 640,000 visitors per year. Uh, these stats are from 2017. Uh, obviously not representative of the last year or two of COVID impacts, but nonetheless kind of gives you an idea. We got about $632 million in, uh, in visitor spending and a total economic output of $924 million, so almost a billion dollars in total economic output, as well as uh, over 8,100 jobs. So we're certainly no Yellowstone, which I understand Yellowstone had about 600,000 visitors in August. Uh, of this year, and we're certainly no Yosemite in terms of like economic output, but this is uh, these are big numbers uh, for Alaska. Keep in mind, we only have about 600,000 residents uh, here in, uh, in the largest state. Uh, Alaska is bigger than five individual U.S. states. So when you're talking about this amount of economic output and, uh, and jobs, this is really significant, not only for the local economy, uh, but the regional or the entire state economy. Some of you might have seen some of the recent uh, media uh, coverage, particularly with some focuses on climate change, uh, showed up in the landslide blog, which is always fun, David Petley's uh, landslide blog, uh, a quite well written article that came up in, uh, in Time magazine, and then also one a little bit further back in uh, National Geographic's uh, online um, environment. And really what I think is fascinating most people here is that not only do we have uh, a landslide that appears to be Im impacted by climate change, but that landslide is impacting infrastructure. And so it's, uh, it's really an opportunity to, uh, to highlight those, those impacts. Just kind of get everyone oriented in where we're talking about uh, in the bottom right inset, uh, inset. You can see the state of Alaska outline there. And then the green polygon within that is Denali National Park. Uh, Denali is over 6 million acres, so it's uh, rather large in size. And then the main figure here, that same green outline depicting um, the, um, the, the outline of Denali on a, on a shaded uh, relief map here. And then that black line that you see there is the Denali Park Road. And the red line is the George Parks Highway, the main north-south road into interior Alaska. So this is the only uh, road that goes into the park, the, the black line, 92 miles long, 148 kilometers. And so it's very, very important uh, for visitor and, and staff access into the park. Uh, drawing down, looking a little bit closer at that Park Road corridor here in uh, the red line. Uh, for some of the, some of you that might be familiar with the area, here are a couple of key spots. Uh, the entrance area there to the east, to the right. Uh, Savage River, uh, which is the end of the first 15 miles of paved road. Uh, beyond that, to the west or the left, it's, uh, it's gravel road. Uh, Teklalika Campground, uh, an area marked there at the Teklalika River, uh, the Toklat River, and uh, an area where about 40 staff uh, live during the summer season to uh, help support visitor service. Uh, Isleson Visitor Center, 
uh, out at about mile 66 of the park road, and then Kantishna out at the end of the road, which is a, is a historic mining area and also an area where there are uh, in private inholders own land and operate lodges out at that point. So keep in mind, dead end road here. And then right at almost the exact middle is the Pretty Rocks uh, landslide at mile 45.4. So coming back to this original slide image, this is a, uh, an image, a composite image from, from some photogrammetry that we had back in 2015, where we first really started realizing uh, that we had a problem. And so just kind of, you know, point out a few of the things here. I mean, first and foremost, anyone knows anything about landslides will probably look down and see this kind of wedge shaped feature down here at the bottom of the valley, like, oh, okay, something has happened before. And so, we were aware of that and we knew that uh, the park road along this section right here had been uh, creeping down slowly through time. So we, we did know that we had some uh, history there um, and didn't well understand that, but it wasn't a big problem and uh, most of our efforts were focused elsewhere. So let me get a little bit into kind of how this began to develop. Uh, first and foremost, uh, some of our uh, anecdotal observations of roadway movement. So the, the road was first put through this area in 1931, and they just like hacked it through here across a, uh, a bedrock and scree slope. And our first uh, recorded movement at the slide first begins in written documents in the 1960s. However, we suspect that movement was occurring here all along. By 1987, uh, they decided to try to do something about this. They put in some geotextile reinforcements uh, as well as some water drains. Unfortunately, the uh, the slide quickly ate those and uh, and rendered them useless. All the way up through 2013, really wasn't that big of a deal. They when we get out there with our spring road opening, when they get their road plowed for snow in the spring, typically around the end of March, uh, the first week or two of April, they'd find a six to 12 inch scarf out there uh, on, on each side of, uh, of this area. And so I'd always hear from the spring road group when they get out there like, oh yeah, it's dropped six inches this year, eight inches that year. It really wasn't that big of a deal. They just roll over it with a grader, uh, patched up and uh, dump some material in there every few years to bring the road back up to uh, an acceptable grade. Then in 2014, uh, our road supervisor approached us and said, you know, things have really picked up uh, for some reason. So just want to bring this to your attention. So we, we started paying closer attention. And uh, through the next few years, we, we did notice that things were speeding up. And so by 2018, we started uh, going out uh, in advance of our uh, spring road opening group so we could get there before they had actually uh, pushed dirt into this and started to improve it. So this is over at the Eastern Scarf on April 8th, 2018. We got there, dug it out, uh, did a little photogrammetry, took a number of measurements, and you know, it was down about uh, three feet. And this seemed huge, big, important deal uh, back in 18, uh, 2018. And, and really it was, but of course the problem continued to develop. Later on that summer, uh, and, and this displacement here is after about six months of the, of the site not being used or, uh, or maintained. Later on in that summer, we had uh, displacement that was occurring uh, up to uh, about one centimeter per day. By 2019, uh, we got out there, shoveled it off, uh, took some measurements, and you can see that things have gotten considerably worse. Uh, the movement had approximately doubled uh, in a year and it had gotten up to about six and a half feet of, uh, of displacement there. We can see a, a two meter uh, GPS rod there. And so by later on that summer, uh, this was a summer that uh, Nikita came up and worked for us. Uh, the, the speeds that are, uh, were, were hitting up to uh, five centimeters per day. And so uh, the, the speed at the, at the height of summer had, um, had increased by a factor of about, of about five. And that was probably due uh, to some very heavy rains uh, that we had that summer as well as some quite warm temperatures. Uh, we got out there earlier because uh, we knew we were going to have to do more work. And by February 12th of that year, we were looking at a, a 16 and a half foot scarp uh, vertically there. That's not even including the uh, the horizontal component, which was lesser uh, in this area. 
And later on in 2020, we had hit up to uh, approximately nine centimeters a day. So not quite a doubling uh, coming into 2020. And then by 2021, uh, we had further increases, although fortunately not a doubling over the winter. We're looking at about an 18 foot uh, scarp there. And then uh, on September 1st this year, we had uh, up to 40 centimeters a day. So again, a, a very rapid increase uh, this year. Here's a photo that a local pilot, Lance Williams, took uh, flying by in January uh, of, of this year. Now it's a little bit hard to believe because there's not much uh, snow there, uh, but it was a light snow year up until later in January. And uh, for, for any of you that have done digital chronology, I think you'll particularly appreciate this because you could really see the, the annual growth rings uh, of our road and, and how we're adding material in there. So you can see uh, the progression through time of those, those rings from uh, 2018 all the way up into uh, to 20 and, and then the red line there showing where it used to be approximately level uh, across this site. Getting into uh, some of the history of some of the, the monitoring that we've done here, we've, we've drilled a, a number of boreholes at this site. We're up into the uh, number, somewhere in the teens, number of boreholes we've drilled into this uh, this mass movement and also around the site to, uh, to try to better understand it. Here's uh, some slope, uh, traditional slope inclinometer uh, measurements from a, a representative uh, site within the landslide. Uh, is installed down to 122 feet below ground surface. You can see a very uh, discrete failure plane at about 68 feet down. And uh, this inclinometer sheared after only about 18 days um, of, after its installation. And really that's kind of what uh, we'd expect. Uh, you know, it had about three and a half inches of, uh, of deformation. And from my experience, at least with traditional slope inclinometers, this is about as much as they can uh, typically take before they're sheared and, and no longer useful. Fortunately, uh, unfortunately, in this site, we didn't really think this was moving, uh, but we learned, in fact, it was. In other locations where we knew it was moving, it would likely displace a traditional slope inclinometer quickly. We installed some uh, some more expensive units. Uh, in this case, it was a uh, Measurand's uh, SAAV product. Uh, a shape array uh, product that is a space line accelerometer that can uh, take more displacement and uh, tell you, uh, you know, similar information to what an SI can. So in, in this example here, the SAAV was installed to uh, 95 feet below the ground surface. And we see again, a very discrete failure plane at about uh, 53 feet down. And the great thing about the SAAV here, it got a uh, up to a maximum deformation of about 43 inches at that uh, failure plane. So it lasts about a uh, an order of magnitude longer than a traditional slope inclinometer in both the duration and time, as well as the amount of displacement that it could take before the, the measurements were no longer viable. We also installed some thermistors uh, in there as well uh, because we, we've known that there was some ice in this from, uh, from previous drilling. And one of the tricky things when you're at the, the margins that the, the elevational and latitudinal margins of permafrost were right there at the margins of permafrost versus no permafrost. And what we realized through time is that some of the sites that we drilled and we thought we did not have permafrost because you drill it down, take a sample, pull it up to the top, stick a thermometer in it and it would be above freezing. So in a lot of sites we thought, well, it's close to permafrost, but not. But what we've realized through time is that uh, you really have to consider the, the, the heat from the drilling. And so if you look at uh, this, uh, this graph through time, you can see that if you were to just have stuck a thermometer in this, it would have, you would have thought there was no permafrost. But after about a month, the temperature really starts to cool off. That heat from the drilling dissipates. And it appears that uh, at this representative site here, we had permafrost about 33 feet uh, below the surface. So pretty much any hole that we uh, we poke in the ground in Denali now, we try to go ahead and put a thermistor in it to, to understand its thermal regime. Also we took a, a number of cores, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we found a number that, uh, that looked like this. Uh, that is uh, not marble. Uh, I can tell you that it's uh, it's ice, and uh, this is from directly underneath the park road. Here's a, just a clip from a, a representative uh, description uh, of this area. 
and you can see highlighted uh, there about 20 feet down, approximately 90% ice, 25 feet down, 85% ice, uh, and the same all the way down to 35 feet. So we're looking at about 15 feet of 85% plus ice directly underneath our road in a site that's barely below freezing. We also have done uh, quite a bit of terrestrial laser scanning uh, over the last couple of years. So we've been uh, pr primarily using a, a Trimble SX-10 instrument uh, to do this. There's a number of things, obviously, that uh, one can do with that. Uh, here's some feature tracking that uh, Chad Holtz, our regional geologist, and uh, some of his staff have helped us with uh, through time, as well as a difference map. Uh, sorry to move kind of quickly here, but uh, here's a, a, an animated GIF of some of that movement from uh, May 5th to September 15th of, uh, of 2020, uh, certainly here with the Park Service where, you know, our emphasis tends to be more on uh, outreach to uh, to non-geoscientists, uh, non-landslide specialists. We, we try to work with a lot with uh, strong and simple um, visuals. And so animated GIFs, uh, time lapses, things like that end up being particularly powerful to uh, for us to communicate uh, what's occurring at this site with uh, with our, our management visitors. Hot off the press, uh, uh, Autumn Helfrich, who is uh, our scientist, one of our scientists and parks uh, participants this year in the park, just got some of this imagery uh, to me this morning that she's been working on throughout the season. And so there's a, a, a series of terrestrial laser scans from May through September uh, of this year. So you can see some of the relatively complex movement of uh, the slide being displaced. You can see a lot of equipment moving around there because as the, the road was moving down, we kept dumping uh, material in there. And uh, to give you an idea, we dumped uh, total this year about 15,000 cubic yards uh, of material in here to, uh, to maintain a road. And uh, with our dump trucks, um, Actually, I'm forgetting the number, but we have about 100, uh, about uh, 12 cubic yards uh, per truck. So that's about a thousand or so uh, dump truck loads of material that had to be put in here. So it was a, a huge effort to, uh, to keep the park road open this summer. Uh, another uh, animated GIF, actually, it's the same one uh, just zoomed in to help you see uh, more closely uh, the road going down there. We also did, uh, we've done quite a bit of uh, photogrammetry here in the park, uh, both with contractors and uh, in in-house capabilities. Here's just a picture looking in the, uh, the what is normally the back seats of uh, one of our airplanes here. You can see uh, photogrammetry uh, set up so we can uh, we can do this uh, in-house with our own airplanes and, uh, and staff. We have uh, setups both uh, at the region and, uh, and here in the park region being based out of uh, Anchorage that uh, supports other parks. Uh, we also have a, a small UAV fleet here in the park. And, uh, here's Britta Schroeder, our, our senior operator. I'm also an operator as well, but about the time that uh, I became an operator is when uh, the ban on uh, most use uh, came across for the Department of Interior. And so unless it's an emergency, we're, we're uh, not allowed to, to do this just for uh, scientific purposes. But we, we have to do a bit of photogrammetry with our UAV fleet. Uh, here's just a quick difference map to show you an example of some of the displacement uh, that's happened through time, as well as just a quick animated GIF between uh, some of our photogrammetry between 2015 uh, and 19, and, uh, in this case, this being a, uh, a red relief map. Another really important thing to uh, consider here is that we, we've had a stepwise temperature increase here recently. Uh, I, uh, after seeing some of the stuff that was happening, I asked uh, Pam Susanis, our climate and weather specialist uh, here in the region, to please take a look at some of our weather data. And we have the, the closest reliable weather stations that we have are at uh, Isleson Visitor Center and uh, at the Toklat River. Unfortunately, these uh, stations haven't been in operation for that long, only back to 2006. And so, of course, you know, with climate people with a uh, very short record like that we always want to uh, talk about this data with uh, some degree of caution since we've got a, a very short record there. But nonetheless, uh, Pam took a look at the at the data and found some interesting uh, trends. 
So at uh, Ileson Visitor Center uh, from 2006 through 2019, we saw a, a really rapid increase in temperatures. In fact, you can pin it down to, uh, I think it was about May of uh, September, uh, excuse me, May of 2013, when temperatures really uh, just stepped up at, uh, at both of these sites. And uh, the, the blue dots there uh, represent um, one of the, when correlated with uh, with other sites that have a longer record going back uh, to 100 years, for example, at the park entrance, uh, that year was one of the 10 coldest years uh, in the last 100 years. And uh, then that red dot there is uh, one of the, the hottest uh, of, the, of the 100 years as well. So uh, that was back in 2016 where we had some really warm temperatures. Uh, taking a look more broadly uh, outside of this area, Alaska statewide temperatures, this correlates really closely with what, with what we've seen. You can see almost all the warmest years have occurred in recent years, particularly the last handful of years with the coldest years happening uh, back in, this, in the 1970s uh, and older. So it gives us some confidence. And although these uh, we don't we have a short record, it's representative of, uh, of greater trends throughout the park uh, and, and the state. As, as a whole. And so uh, think back to uh, when we first noticed the slide started to accelerate was in 2014 and we had a stepwise temperature increase uh, about that same time. And what's notable about that is not only the 4.3 uh, degree temperature increase at mean, uh, mean annual temperature increase of 4.3 degrees at, uh, at Toklap and 4.5 degrees Fahrenheit at uh, Ileson Visitor Center is that at, uh, at Ileson, for example, this moved the mean annual temperature from below freezing to above freezing for the first time uh, that we are aware of at, uh, at any time. And also uh, bumped us up to where we are already hitting expected temperatures for 2040. So it appears we need to do some, um, some revision on our um, climate change um, predictions for the future because we're already realizing uh, temperatures that were expected 20 or more years out. And then uh, one of the other really key things that we've been working on the last few years that uh, Nikita really helped us make huge advances with back in 2019, we realized a, a need for a real-time monitoring system. You know, terrestrial laser scanning, uh, photogrammetry, and other techniques are, are great, but you have to uh, spend the time in the field, uh, get back to post-processing, create products, and by that time, you could uh, already uh, have someone that's uh, safety is, uh, is being threatened. And so we wanted to get a, a near real time monitoring system in place uh, to really to focus on visitor and staff safety. Now, in this setting, that becomes particularly challenging because we don't have line power. Uh, there are no power lines anywhere nearby in the setting. Uh, and we also don't have any kind of um, communications uh, at this site. Uh, cellular service doesn't exist here, and so we have to use satellite systems, and so that be, ends up being pretty complicated, particularly in a national park setting where uh, there's a high value placed on uh, the uh, creating a, a wilderness experience for visitors. In fact, uh, 150 feet away from the center line of the park road through here is a federally designated wilderness. And uh, some of our staff really don't want me uh, clouding up uh, people's uh, vistas with uh, monitoring equipment and uh, and solar panels. So it's quite the quite the challenge, but nonetheless, we've been working on that and we're finding that through time. So here's a picture taken from the park road, looking down at our at our monitoring station, pretty much how it's looked uh, for the last two years. You can see it is a, a quite a beautiful area. Uh, it's it's a nice office environment to, to work in as far as the, the view at least. Sometimes the weather is not so nice out here. Just to zoom in of that picture and uh, highlight a few things here for you. Uh, the yellow device underneath there is a, is a Trimble automated uh, total station. Uh, another way of saying that is a, a robotic total station. So we set that up. Uh, on intervals, it wakes up and uh, typically once an hour, uh, we do a scan of approximately uh, 30 prisms in and around uh, the landslide to, uh, to get measurements. Uh, here's Nikita sighting in one of the prisms uh, down the landslide. You can see they're very small one inch prisms, matte black finish. And so it doesn't draw visitors attention to these, uh, these prisms scattered all around the landslide when they're passing through on our buses. 
Uh, we also have a time-lapse camera. Uh, we actually have three time-lapse cameras out there right at the moment. Uh, this is one of the older versions that, uh, that we had some trouble with. We've uh, now moved on primarily to, uh, to Taiki 3 Pro uh, cameras that we're having uh, quite uh, great success with now. We also have a uh, professional uh, uh, weather station there, uh, wind direction speed, uh, tipping gauge rain bucket, and a uh, shielded thermometer. Uh, we also have a, a satellite system here to get that data relayed out. And then, of course, all the brains, batteries, solar chargers and such in the, uh, in the boxes here with the uh, solar panels facing south on the other side of the station. Here's just a quick map to show you, you know, the approximate distribution of the prisms throughout the landslide. Uh, the triangles uh, represent like our monitoring station and some of our back sites. Uh, well, whereas the uh, the other ones actually look a little like little GPS uh, sensors or our prisons that are scattered throughout throughout the slide. So I want to show you a quick screenshot from what some of the output from the automated total station. Uh, Trimble's got a pretty nifty product called uh, uh, T4D uh, that we can utilize. And so the automated total station takes the shots, satellite system uh, uploads that into uh, into their their server our local server back at park headquarters and then into a uh, triple servers and then we utilize uh, a web interface from anywhere that you've got internet uh, not only can you, you check the data streams but you can set up automated alerts to where um, even if you're asleep at home at two o'clock at night and if there's some uh, displacement uh, that exceeds some boundaries that you can set you can get uh, automated text messages, uh, emails, uh, and such to, to let you know. So you don't have to be actively uh, watching the system. So this is just a screen grab from a few key prisms uh, that we are monitoring uh, this season. So you can see back into uh, to, to June and even early July, we're having, by our standards now, relatively slow displacements of five, six centimeters. We can just hover uh, over, over any one of these data points and provide you a, a quick summary of, uh, of that what that um, what that prism is doing uh, in, in four dimensions and you can see right here on July 24th we had a substantial uptick in the prisms we had about a inch inch and a quarter rain that sped things up unfortunately when it dried out uh, a bit the velocities didn't slow uh, they stayed relatively high and then as we got another rain it stepped up another rain it stepped up until finally uh, on um, August 22nd, I believe it was a Sunday, got a call from our deputy superintendent asking me to come out to the site. Uh, the road crew was getting concerned about maintaining a safe passage through there. And then by two days later, we, uh, we issued a press release on August 24th, uh, notifying all of our stakeholders that the park road was going to be closing early uh, for the season uh, because the displacements were continuing to grow rapidly. Uh, there was more rain in the forecast. Our road crew was having uh, considerable difficulty uh, maintaining the road surface. It was getting soft, it was getting cracks, it was tilting toward the outside, and so we were really uh, uh, concerned about uh, the conditions there. Interestingly, uh, not soon after that, or not too far after that, excuse me, uh, the, uh, the velocities peaked, uh, and of course, that's just 2020 hindsight, but now looking back on September uh, 1st, the velocities peaked for most of the prisms. And uh, this blue line here represents a, uh, a, a prism that was immediately on the on the edge of the road. And so that that peaked at just short of uh, 40 centimeters uh, per day. Uh, we're looking at a three hour average. Uh, this this uh, graph here is showing uh, the road rate, uh, the prism rates over averaging them over days. And so that kind of displays a little bit differently depending on how you're processing it. You can also see that we had other prisms uh, down, the, down the road that were going uh, considerably faster and finally sped up until they, they, they tipped over and we could no longer uh, monitor them anymore. But uh, you know, we, we watch those out of concern, but since they're a little bit further away from the road, they're not uh, as critical uh, for our monitoring efforts, but some, some very rapid rates considering you've got critical infrastructure on top of it. Uh, here's a time lapse we uh, that we took uh, from uh, July of this year uh, through August and, uh, and into September. I'll repeat this uh, a few times for you. 
and you can see some of the displacement happening here. I'll try to hover my uh, my cursor here for uh, a quick bit. This is the site of that fastest prism uh, that we saw uh, moving right there. And then the uh, the other prism I was saying that was immediately adjacent to the road was located toward the east side up high here. Play it for you one more time here. You can also find this on some park websites and I'll watch that uh, at uh, if you'd like to some more. Just kind of giving you some representative ideas of what's going on. Here's some pictures from uh, from just before we closed the road. I think this was on the Sunday or Monday just before we closed the road. Uh, this the road at this point had uh, had just been graded. This is near the Western Scarp and had also been compacted and run over by a few vehicles. Yeah, it only took uh, one of our staff members uh, a couple of steps here to see that the road is uh, starting to pump there and become uh, very soft. And so obviously uh, that was a concern for us. And then also another interesting development over at the, the near the eastern scarp immediately above the road we saw something that looked pretty unusual one of our operators drew my attention to it uh, i crawled down there in the muck got out the water bottle and uh, started rinsing it off and we were uh, quite amazed uh, to find this on the on the scarp uh, i think you can probably tell but that is near uh, pure ice uh, that was being exposed on the scarf. Uh, that here's our facilities manager taking uh, taking a look at uh, at that ice. Some of the other monitoring that we uh, we did at the site as well. We uh, we used vibrating wire piezometers to get an idea of the water level in the slide. However, uh, you know, it did provide some useful information uh, in some of the sites we'd see the, the water levels increasing. There was a pretty good correlation with speed ups. Not too surprising for anyone that works with landslides. You got to watch the water. Uh, but in our case, that gets considerably complicated by the permafrost. So uh, most of the water that we've come across in the slide has been in the, in the form of ice. We've also had uh, one collection of airborne LIDAR in this area, uh, numerous uh, collections of uh, di differential GPS on some of the monuments that we put in the landslide. Uh, satellite imagery, both optical and recently we've been getting some SAR imagery for the site uh, as well and, uh, and many others, but I, I didn't want to get too bogged down and just trying to cover the full breadth of, uh, of what we're doing at the site. I just wanted to kind of give you a, a brief sample. And just a little quick discussion here. Um, I'd like to develop this further, but this, is a, this has been a, a fast moving issue for us uh, this season. It's been stressful for many people in the park and particularly for our uh, in holders that operate lodges out beyond this site. As you can imagine, they're very concerned, not only for the, the cut in the business that they have this year by the season being truncated, but uh, also uh, looking into the future. Well, one of the things I think probably a lot of you are asking or maybe you're getting some ideas uh, based on what you've seen is like, what is this? You know, like in general, when I'm talking to visitors and managers, I just describe it as a, as a landslide uh, or a mass movement. Uh, but really, that's just kind of putting a, a generic name on it. And to be honest with you, we really struggled uh, with what to do. Uh, with what to what to call this. And, you know, I, I read and reread uh, Hungary Dolls uh, paper, can't remember for sure, but I believe that's like 2014 or 2016, where they did an update to the Varnes classification system. And it just really didn't fit in any of those bins very well. And we did some cramming and trying to mash it in some and or maybe calling it a few of them, but it just really never quite fit. And then 2019, we got more borehole information, had a lot of great conversations with Makita and some of our other staff. And I was reading a paper about uh, rock glaciers and then kind of had that light bulb moment. So straight from Wikipedia, if you look up rock glacier, it says paraglacial glaciers or ter uh, talus derived glaciers and glacial rock glaciers. Now, at this point in presentations, people that tend to know a bit about landslides are like, that's not a rock glacier. It doesn't look like anything like any of the ones I've ever seen. And I think that's a, a reasonable, um, 
reasonable point. In fact, I think why I came to the realization that this is likely a rock glacier uh, quite late. I think what most of us have in mind is a, a glacier that's retreated back up uh, into its uh, uh, near its head wall, and the, the glacial ice gets uh, protected by a, a blanket of, uh, of rock. And, uh, you know, it still maintains a, a glacier-like morphology. And if you look at this site, it uh, doesn't look like a glacier. Effectively, probably never was a glacier. There wasn't glacial ice uh, here probably for 10,000 or more uh, years. However, once I realized there's this distinct set of rock glaciers that uh, some people refer to as paraglacial uh, rock glaciers, these uh, tailless derived glaciers, that, that's when we started to realize what we, what we had here. And then I came across this paper uh, I thought I had the attribution in there, but it's from uh, Mulroy et al. 2016, and I saw this, and it's like someone had had drawn a conceptual model for the Pretty Rocks Rock Glacier here. The head wall is the right shape; it looks exactly uh, like what, what we have here. And this is this is kind of what where we realized what we had. Where we've got a, a head wall that's uh, shedding uh, abundant talus. Uh, water makes its way down into that talus uh, where there's permafrost present. So uh, just to quickly define that for some of you that might be familiar with it, uh, might not be familiar with it, uh, permafrost is defined as uh, material that's at or below freezing for, for two or more years. And we certainly have those conditions here in Denali, although it seems to be changing. And so when water runs down into that talus and the permafrost, uh, it freezes and then that material flows down the slope through time. And while we're on this topic, we, uh, we BGC Engineering brought in one of their uh, permafrost specialists, uh, Lucas Aronson, that took a look at this. I believe he had done some of his PhD work on rock glaciers and uh, confirmed that, that that is, in fact, uh, what we're working with. So in some of our efforts to, uh, to share this with the public, uh, we, we work with some, uh, some uh, geoscientists and parks and scientists and parks uh, illustrators to, uh, to help get this across uh, to our visitors. So here's here's one vision of our uh, our subsurface that's kind of held up through time. This was done a few years ago now by, um, by Laurel Mundy. And you can see the uh, the original road alignment there shown by the uh, the red line and then the slunk road alignment and how that tends to develop uh, through time with some of our fastest movement happening near the center. And then the inside inset over to the left, uh, showing the kind of representative ground conditions that we have encountered through uh, through boreholes. Uh, the yellow top part is the uh, the active layer or the part that uh, that thaws each year, based on what we've seen from the measurements. It looks like our active layer is you know somewhere around the uh, the level of ten feet or about three meters uh, down at this site. And then typically then below that, we get into kind of that uh, brownish uh, blue section there, which is relatively ice poor permafrost. So uh, not much ice uh, in there, but nonetheless satisfies the conditions for permafrost. And then once we get down below that in the bluer area there, that's ice rich permafrost. And by ice rich, we mean the ice is occupying uh, more than just the space in between the grains. And so there really really quite a bit of ice within that. And uh, you know, oftentimes uh, 75, and as I, I showed you in the logs before, even up to 90% or more ice, just depending on what length of core that you're looking at. And then beneath that, a very discrete uh, failure plane, and then into uh, bedrock uh, that's underneath that. It's one of the interesting things when you consider this as being a, uh, a rock glacier. Rock glaciers tend to creep uh, pretty slow uh, on the order of centimeters per year uh, through internal deformation of that ice. And that's what we think we were seeing uh, previous to 2013 or 2014, relatively slow movement through time. And then something transitioned uh, in 2014 and where we saw much more rapid movement. In this case, we know that we've got failure along a, a discrete failure plane that's uh, accounting for most of our displacement. And going back and doing some uh, looks at the uh, the literature of rock glaciers, there are others that have uh, hypothesized that other rock glaciers that have sped up uh, in the Alps have transitioned from uh, movement primarily along the uh, deformation of the ice grains within the sediment 
uh, to basal uh, sliding. And, uh, and we don't know that we've gone through that transition here, but we do know that most of the displacement is, is happening along that uh, discrete failure plane at the bottom. Just to quickly show you what the, the quote uh, bedrock looks like under this site. Uh, we have actually moved away from using that terminology with non-specialists because it creates some confusion. Uh, here's a, an illustration that uh, Tracy Faber did for us uh, a couple of years ago, showing you know kind of what the site would look like if you're flying by in a helicopter or an airplane, which uh, quite a few of our visitors do fly past here in airplanes on, uh, on scenic tours. If you slice that and you kind of like look back into the mountain, we've got uh, some more competent rock represented by the, the blue on each side, and then very incompetent uh, bedrock there represented by that orange stripe. Now, all the, uh, both the blue and the orange, uh, or excuse me, the blue on the left is uh, basaltic uh, material, and the, the yellow or orange in the middle and the blue on the right is, uh, is rhyolite. And the Rhyolite on the right is, uh, you know, kind of what Yellowstone National Park gets its name from, and it's relatively uh, competent rock, whereas the uh, yellow-orange material in the middle uh, is, is largely volcanic ash. And as that volcanic ash is, uh, is thawing and is no longer permafrost, it uh, is so incompetent, it's actually not only sliding, but in many cases it's flowing um, in debris flows. And so we can have a, a warm day on that material with sun shining on it, and it actually turns into a small debris flow. So very tricky material. So only do we have this rock glacier sliding on top, once you get to the bedrock underneath, uh, very challenging material to, uh, to main infrastructure on. And then one of the questions I get from a lot of folks is like, well, if you got this loose material that's sliding on top, why don't you just dig down deep enough until you get into better material behind it? Unfortunately, that, uh, that, uh, that, that volcanic ash that has uh, a lot of uh, ice rich uh, permafrost in it extends way back, uh, a couple of miles, in fact, uh, back through uh, par roughly paralleling the, uh, the park road there. So there's uh, no depth that we know that we could dig to and get back to better material. We're always going to be on similar material. So unfortunately, it's kind of like we have an Oreo uh, in this site. And um, yeah, it's uh, not a very good Oreo from a management perspective for a national park. OK, so what are we going to do about this now? I was uh, just telling our uh, moderators and uh, about this before we started with the uh, the presentation. I'm not going to go into this too much. It's a, it's a sensitive topic uh, management decisions around this. I'm mostly going to adhere to uh, to science here, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the geology team is obviously going to continue to, uh, to monitor this site. Uh, with various techniques and to uh, and to advise our management as to, to what we have on the ground here. Uh, we're working with a, a number of people to expand our permafrost monitoring and modeling. Uh, one of our main partners is, uh, is uh, our, our main PI on that project is Louise Farquharson, who's actually out in the park doing some research right now, and a broader team including Dan Mann, um, uh, and, and others uh, that are working with us from the permafrost lab in, uh, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Also going to continue, uh, management is continuing to consider a range of options at the site. Uh, there have been proposed uh, options to completely reroute the road uh, through what is now de uh, federally designated wilderness. We'd be looking at about a six mile reroute completely around uh, this section of the park road. Uh, to the tune of probably a few hundred million dollars, uh, about 10 years of uh, construction, a uh, million cubic yards of uh, fill needed to, uh, to do that. And so those would be very uh, painful options uh, for the park and uh, its visitors and our, our resources. Most likely, uh, we're going to be looking at building a bridge over this site. You know, as a uh, classic with a lot of geohazards, if you can, you just get out of its way. So we're, we're actively uh, seeking options to, uh, to just bridge this whole thing and get out of the way. One of the, uh, the challenging things that we have to do here is to try to honor the, uh, the NPS mission and uh, to break that down as simply as I can. We want to uh, both protect the, the park's resources 
but at the same time, we also want to provide for the enjoyment of the people. And that uh, that balance is often hard to achieve. And I think that's certainly uh, the case here. So we want to keep visitors uh, having safe experiences out there. And uh, that's going to likely require some uh, pretty heavy modifications uh, of the area. But we, won't, we don't want to have a, an inordinate uh, impact on those on those resources because as uh, as folks in the in our uh, agency say you know we're in the business of forever okay so a quick summary just looking at the trajectory uh, of this slide in uh, up until 2004 we were looking at inches per year by 2018 we we're looking at inches per month uh, in 19 we got to inches per day and then this year we we're approaching inches per hour. So obviously one of the big questions is, what is 2022 uh, going to look like? And, uh, and, and also before I get into this next point, um, we already, uh, being out the site yesterday, we're looking at the Eastern Scarp is down 21 feet, which is already worse than it was uh, last spring when we started maintenance. And so uh, we're going to be uh, going into uh, next spring with a real challenge ahead of us and trying to uh, reestablish the park road. So we've obviously got a, a complicated mass movement here. Really, I think how it's best described as a rock glacier complex. Uh, we have some traditional landsliding that's going on here. We've got rock fall that's feeding the rock glacier. We've got debris flows uh, happening on warm days as well as uh, rainy days. And so we really have a, a lot of different processes going on at the site. And in the future, uh, you know, we're expecting this, uh, the displacement rates to, uh, to increase. Uh, we're probably aggravating uh, the situation by adding all this material, but we don't really have a lot of choice if we want to try to, to, to maintain the road. We'd like to control the water uh, coming into the site better, but with this uh, rate of displacement, it's very hard to control that. And, uh, you know, obviously, Still have a lot of work needed to uh, to do to try to maintain a safe and uh, resilient infrastructure, not only at this site here, but uh, among the uh, other 140 or so unstable slopes that we've quantified along the park road, uh, and then across Alaska and other areas that are experiencing uh, similar problems. And uh, with that, I'll wrap things up, and hopefully we can have a few minutes to entertain some questions here. <laughs>